Good morning to you all and greetings in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hope that you are all doing well. Uh, we haven't heard otherwise. We're thankful that none of our regular church members have contracted the virus or uh, come down with it as far as we know. We do want you to know that we are continually monitoring this situation. As you all are aware that Georgia has uh, lifted the stay-at-home orders, uh, not lifted all the uh, restrict, uh, restrictions entirely. Uh, so we are monitoring it. We want to respect our government, realize uh, that they understand uh, these things a lot better than, than we do just as a church and what's good for us meeting, uh, for large groups meeting together. But we also do want to be able to meet together as soon as we can. Uh, so we will keep you informed about that. So just know that we are uh, paying close attention to that. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, is where we will be this morning. I had originally planned, after we finished Jude, to begin a series through Ecclesiastes, but since uh, we do have a number of elderly people in the church who are not able to access uh, these sermons, I figured that it would be best uh, to wait uh, to do that. So Luke chapter 13, uh, we will read in a moment, uh, beginning in verse 1. Suffering is a reality of life in our fallen world. No matter of our standing or situation in life, no one is immune to it. It's true that if we live long enough, we will suffer in one way or another, to one extent or another. But it is also true that some people suffer more than others. We will all suffer, but we will not all suffer with the same things or to the same extent. Well, why is that the case? Well, it depends on who you ask. You might get a different answer. The atheists would say that you could explain certain things like health issues with science, but most other things uh, are necessarily and can only be random occurrences. The Hindu and the Buddhist would explain all of this with the idea of karma. Perform good deeds and good things will happen to you. Perform bad deeds and bad things will come instead. But what do Christians say? Well, we might say that Christians have said and do say many different things, some of which are profoundly wrong or not true. To talk to some Christians, you get the idea uh, that, that they understand suffering and the way things happen in life very much in the same way that Hindus and Buddhists do with the idea of karma. Or if you talk to others, you will get the idea that suffering comes as a lack of faith. This is what we hear from those people who call themselves Christians and preach the prosperity gospel. That if you just have enough faith that physical health and prosperity will come your way. But in our text from this, for this morning, Jesus tells us how we ought to respond to suffering. Now he doesn't go into a long, drawn-out answer to why suffering happens, to why, as we often hear it put, why bad things happen to good people or why bad things happen at all. But what Jesus does is to help us to understand what we really ought to be asking and how we ought to respond to the suffering that we see around us. So if you would, read with me beginning in verse 1 of Luke 13. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
were those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you, all, you will all likewise perish. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for your word and its truth. And we pray that in these moments that it would go forth in power and that you would help us to understand the profound answer that Jesus gives to the reality of the suffering around us. And we pray that through the work of the Spirit that we would take it to heart, that we would act on it, that we would heed Jesus' words. And it's for Christ's sake we pray. Amen. So Jesus uh, is presented in this passage with a situation that happened at the time, a current situation, that there were some uh, Galileans who had been killed uh, by uh, the order of Pilate. And so Jesus is presented with this situation. It's likely the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about what has happened. It was certainly scandalous. And But Jesus also, in this passage, he also gives another situation for his audience to consider. So you have the situation of the murdered Galileans. You also have the situation of these 18 people in Siloam who were killed by the collapsing of a tower. But before we get into and look at these situations it would be helpful for us to consider what these situations represent. The first situation that Jesus is presented with is what we would call moral evil. And the second situation that Jesus himself gives for the consideration of his hearers is what we would call natural evil. Now, this is a way that we often, and that theologians and people throughout the history of the church have thought and have uh, thought in these categories to distinguish uh, types of evil from one another for the sake of clarity. So what do we mean by these uh, titles? Well, moral evil refers to intentional human acts. So think of the things prohibited by the Ten Commandments, idolatry, murder, adultery, theft, etc. So in short, in a word, moral evil is another name for sin. Natural evil, on the other hand, is how we would describe anything bad that happens, that happens outside of human uh, action, willful human action, or control. So anything that happens outside of a human willing this bad thing, this evil thing, to happen. So here we think of things like tornadoes, floods, tsunamis, cancer, a boat sunk at sea uh, by, the, by a raging storm, and even the coronavirus. So this is how we can think about these two situations. Jesus presents two situations, one in which there is an active uh, human uh, agent who brings about this evil, namely Pilate, and then in the second situation where it is what we would call an evil or suffering that is brought about, not by the direct causation of any human being. So let's consider the first situation of the murdered Galileans. Now we don't know any other details about this incident other than what we have here in the text. But what we do have tells us that there were some Galileans who had come up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices in the temple and that they were murdered while they were in the temple. Now, if you're following along in the text, you may be wondering where some of that information uh, came from. Well, we know that it had to have taken place in Jerusalem because the temple was the only place that sacrifices could lawfully be made. And we know that the murders happened in the temple because we are told that their blood 
was mingled with their sacrifices. So in other words, their blood was spilled in the very same place that the blood of the sacrifices they had offered was spilt. And all of this happened under the command of Pilate, the same Pilate who had Jesus crucified. Now, if we just think about the situation for a moment, as I said previously, this would have been extremely scandalous to the Jews. The Jews were already highly resistant, did not like the occupation uh, and being under the, the rule of the Roman Empire. And here you have this event that has happened where Pilate, who is the Roman official in, uh, in Jerusalem, has gives the order, we would say is more likely rather than him doing himself, gives the order for these Galileans to be killed in the temple as they're offering their sacrifices. This would have been extremely scandalous among the Jews and would have uh, definitely resulted in a lot of conversation, a lot of further bitterness and hatred, but also a lot of conversation as to why this happened, and especially why it happened to these people in particular. But this is clearly an act of moral evil on Pilate's part. The suffering of these Galileans came at the hand of another person. Even if he did not murder these people with his own hand, they were only murdered because he commanded it. So before we consider Jesus' response to this, I want us to go ahead and, and look at the second situation, consider it as well. So the second situation has to do with the collapse of the tower in Siloam. As with the first situation, we don't know any more details about the event than that are given to us in the text. All we know that is that a tower in Siloam fell and that when it did, it killed 18 people. So both groups of people, the Galileans and these 18 people, died. One group was not more dead than the other. But the situation was different. This tower fell of its own accord. Nobody sabotaged it. Nobody caused it to fall. It simply fell and it killed 18 people. This is what, as we just said, would be an act of natural evil. Who would doubt that the loved ones of this group grieved just as much as the loved ones of the Galileans? But who's to blame? Who can we point the fingers at to say that they did this? Who's responsible for this? Well, nobody. No human person, anyway. We can't say that these people were murdered because murder is a moral act carried out by a moral agent. We can only say that they were killed. So here we have these two situations that Jesus uh, presents and that Jesus uh, presents for the consideration of his audience. But how does Jesus respond? This is what is significant here. Clearly these are events that people were curious about. These were events that certainly people would have wanted to know what Jesus had to say about it. And so Jesus, initially in his response, he raises the question in relation to the first, uh, the first instance, were these Galileans worse sinners than all of the other Galileans? In other words, were they murdered because they deserved it? Did their suffering come as a result of their sin? You say, why would Jesus ask us? Well, Jesus asked us because this is what most people thought. We can see this mindset in the disciples in John chapter 9. We read, as he passed by, Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. So you can see in the disciples' thinking that there is a correlation between personal suffering and personal guilt, or perhaps the guilt of parents. So in other words, what a lot of people would have instinctively thought 
even in the midst of them being outraged at Pilate for what he did in murdering these Galileans, the fact that it happened to them, there must have been some kind of connection, something that they did that brought this about. And so they wanted to know what they had done to deserve what happened to them. But Jesus says, that's the wrong question. He responds in a way that perhaps we would not expect. No, I tell you, he says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, yes, these people were worse sinners than the other Galileans. He doesn't say Pilate should be charged for this. Somebody should hold him, should make him more accountable that we should not put up with this. He doesn't even say that Pilate should repent of this. He says, what should we make of this suffering? What should we think of it? How should we respond to it? He says, you should repent. You should repent. Now that is audacious to say the least, right? We would not expect this. We would expect Jesus to join with what would have uh, most assuredly been the response of all the other Jews in condemnation of Pilate or wondering might what, what might have been the sin of these Galileans. And Jesus tells them, unless you repent, you likewise will perish. So does he mean that if they didn't repent, that they would all be murdered at the hand of Pilate in the temple while they were offering sacrifices? Of course not. That's not what he meant. What did he mean then? What he meant to say is that judgment is coming on all men and women who do not repent. He says that they would likewise perish. Judgment is coming. Why would he say such a thing? Because we're all sinners. That's why he would say such a thing. What he's saying is that if we don't repent, that if we're not repentant, if we don't repent of our sins, realize that we have sinned, and repent of our sins, turn away from our sins, then our fate is that we will perish. The Bible says that this is what we have deserved as a result of all of, all of our sin. That our sin has separated us from God. And because of that separation, we stand condemned. And we stand deserving of God's wrath to be poured out on us. But there is good news here that Jesus says, He doesn't just say that you will all likewise perish. He says, if you do not repent, you will likewise perish. There is hope for us. And what Jesus is saying is when we see the suffering of others around us, when we're confronted with the reality of suffering, instead of pointing fingers, instead of trying to place blame, instead of trying to figure out what those people did, he's saying we should take stock of our own lives and we should repent. Because if we don't, then we will likewise perish. But the good news is that we can repent. That Jesus died, that Jesus shed His own blood, that Jesus Himself suffered and bore the wrath of God so that we do not have to perish. And so what falls to us? Repent. We must repent. But what shall we say about Jesus' response to the second situation? Now again, remember that the first situation was presented to Jesus from the outside. All these people around him are talking about what had happened. But Jesus himself presents for consideration the second 
the second situation. And so why would Jesus do that? Well, again, as we said, here we have the difference between somebody who actively themselves has committed this evil act that resulted in the death of these Galileans. But what do we do now when there's nowhere to point fingers, when there's no one to blame? We understand that people can do awful things to people who didn't do anything to deserve it. But surely it must be different in circumstances where no human action is in the equation. Now, as these Jewish people, they would have understood that God is in control. If God wanted to prevent that tower from falling, then it would not have fallen. So if God allowed it to fall, or perhaps they might have thought that God caused it to fall on these people, then surely there must have been something that they had done. That there was some reason it happened to them and not to to me, or not to you, not to us. But Jesus' response is the same. Literally, His response is the exact same to both of these events, the moral evil, the natural evil. Jesus says the exact same thing. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And perhaps this second situation is a lot more pertinent to us right now because we are in the midst of a situation that is wreaking havoc on our world that has done a number on our economy, on numerous other economies around the world, that has killed numerous people, perhaps even people that we know, people that we love. And yes, there are theories going around about what kind of role did China have in this and what kind of of active role. And we want to point fingers and place blame. But in light of all the conspiracy theories and in light of everything else, how should we respond to this? We should look at ourselves. That the suffering that we see in the world around us right now, the suffering that we see even in our own community right now should cause us to examine ourselves that this suffering in the world going on right now is a good thing to the extent that it serves as a wake-up call for us to examine our own lives. Perhaps this is exactly what some of us needed because we've just been cruising along in our lives, giving no thought to our souls, no thought to our own state, no thought to what would happen to us if we were to die. And so with all this suffering and death around us, it is a prime opportunity to awake from our slumber and to examine ourselves. This is a wake-up call for us to repent. But what would I say to you, Christian, to our church people, church members, other believers who are watching this, who have repented, who have put their faith in Christ, who are saved? Is there any exhortation here for us? Yes, the same call to repent. We may already be saved, but this is a great time for us to take stock of our lives to see ways that we have fallen short, that we continue to fall short, patterns in our lives, patterns in our minds, things that we are doing that are not pleasing to God, ways that we have not been concerned for holiness, ways that we have put God in the back seat. This is a wake-up call for us to repent. And so this thought should lead us to repent, but there's also something else as Christians that this should lead us to do. When we see suffering in the world, when we see suffering around us, it should cause us to hope and to rejoice. And you say, 
Why would we have hope? Why would we rejoice in the midst of this? Now, certainly I'm not saying that we rejoice in the suffering of others. But as Christians, as people who are in Christ, we rejoice that in Christ we have a hope to which no amount of suffering can compare. That in Christ we have been given life, eternal life. That as Jesus said, that even though we might die, even if the coronavirus were to take our lives, we would still live. Even if we were murdered in the middle of a church service while we're trying to worship God, or if a building falls on top of us and kills us, we still have hope that goes beyond this life. And so for Christians, this should be a wake-up call for us to repent in the areas that we need to. But it should also cause us to rejoice that even though all this suffering is going on around us, that even though it might come into our own homes and might even affect us and take our lives, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear because we have repented, we will not perish. And this is exactly what we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. That God even uses suffering for our good. Paul says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison." So what should we think? That we should rejoice always, even in this difficult time, even in the midst of suffering if we are in Christ because of the hope that we have and that any suffering that comes into our life, God is using it to prepare us for eternity, to prepare us for an eternal weight of glory. So this is good news for us. And so what should we say to this suffering? How should we respond? Instead of pointing fingers, instead of wondering what this person did for this to happen to them, or what that person did, and how great of a sinner they must have been, and how bad and how many things that they did wrong, we should look at ourselves. And so I pray, my prayer my prayer has been that for all of you, all of you are church members, and even for those of you, others of you that are watching this, that God would use this time to wake us up spiritually, to see our need of Christ if we do not know Him, and to see the ways that we have failed in our responsibility as Christ's disciples. And so, may we, re may we resist the urge to look to everybody else, but may we listen to Christ, and may this suffering drive us to look to ourselves, not because that we have the strength in ourselves to get through this, but to look to ourselves to make sure that our souls are not in danger of perishing. And so, may we heed the words of Scripture that God may be glorified in us. Let's pray together. Our Father, how... Sobering a reminder is this, that when we see suffering around us, that it should cause us to look to ourselves, that we should take stock of our souls, that we should repent. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity, this wake-up call that you have given us. We pray that it would bear much fruit in our lives. That if there are any who are watching this 
who do not know you, that they would be drawn to repentance. And that for all of your children, that they would be renewed in their zeal for holiness. And that they would rejoice in the hope that we have, that regardless of what comes our way, that we will not perish. So we pray that by the power of the Spirit, that you would work in us what is pleasing in your sight. And through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. In the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.